spare their own gender from coming into law. In particular, experts have warned that the bill would likely make single-sex spaces in other parts of the UK much harder to maintain, as they would too have to recognize the individual's self-declared gender rather than the individual's biological sex. And those are your headline news this morning. God love you. The saint of the day is St. Charles of Sez and St. Vincenza Mary Lopez y Vucuna. St. Charles of Sez was born October 19, 1613 in the southeast of Rome. Charles was inspired by the lives of Salvatore Horta and Pascal Ballon to become a Franciscan. He did that in 1635. He tells us in his autobiography, Our Lord put in my heart a determination to become a lay brother with a great desire to be poor and to beg alms for his love. Charles served as a cook, a porter, sacristan, gardener, and beggar at various friaries in Italy. In some ways, he was an accident waiting to happen. He once started a huge fire in the kitchen when the oil was in which he was frying onions burst into flames. One story shows how thoroughly Charles adopted the spirit of St. Francis. The superior ordered Charles, then porter, to give food only to traveling friars who came to the door. Charles obeyed this direction simultaneously. The, uh, si simultaneously, the alms to the friars decreased. Charles convinced his superior the two facts were related. When the friars resumed giving goods to all who asked at the door, alms to the friars increased also. At the direction of his confessor, Charles wrote his autobiography, The Grandeur of the Mercies of God. He also wrote several other spiritual books. He made good use of his spiritual, his various spiritual directors throughout the years. They helped him discern which of his ideas or ambitions were from God, and Charles himself was sought out for spiritual advice. The dying Pope Clement IX asked Charles to be at his bedside for a blessing. Charles had a firm sense of God's providence. Father Severano Gori had said of him, by word and example, he recalled in all the need of pursuing only that which is eternal. He died in San Francesco at Ripa in Rome and was buried there in January 6, 1670. St. Vincenza Mary Lopez is the foundress of the Daughters of Mary Immaculate. Born at Casiquenta, Navarra, Spain, in March 22, 1847, she was a daughter of a lawyer. She took a vow of chastity and aided by her aunt, Euledia de Vinsuna, and she refused the arranged marriage, which had been organized by her parents. In 1876, she established the Daughters in order to offer some protection to the vulnerable young women who worked as domestic servants. Papal approval was secured in 1888 by Pope Leo XIII, and Vincencia died two years later in Madrid on December 26th after intense suffering from illness. St. Charles of Sins and St. Vincenza pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Jesus entered the synagogue. There was a man there who had a withered hand. They watched Jesus closely to see if he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to them, he said to the man with the withered hand, come up here before us. Then he said to the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil, to save life rather than to destroy it? But they remained silent, looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart, Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Ignatius Catholic Commentary today said, uh, Jesus implies that doing good for the sake of mercy or necessity does not constitute a violation of the Sabbath. One should abstain from servile works, not good works. Very, very insightful, I would say. The applicant would say, after confounding the Jews who had blamed his disciples for pulling the ears of corn on the Sabbath day by the example of David, the Lord now further bringing them to the truth works a miracle on the Sabbath, showing that if it is a pious deed to work miracles on the Sabbath for the health of men, it is not wrong to do on the Sabbath things necessary for the body. Close quote, the applicant.
The Venerable Bede would say, but mystically, the man with the withered hand shows the human race, dried up as to its fruitfulness in good works, but now cured by the mercy of the Lord, the hand of the man, which in our first parent had been dried up when he plucked the fruit of the forbidden tree, through the grace of the Redeemer who stretched his guiltless hands on the tree of the cross, has been restored to health by the juices of good works." Well, too, was it in the synagogue that the hand was withered, for where the gift of knowledge is greater, there also the danger of inexcusable guilt is greater. The applicant would go on to say, but the soldiers of Herod the king are called Herodians because a certain new heresy had sprung up, which asserted that Herod was the Christ. For the prophecy of Jacob intimated that when the princes of Judah failed, then Christ should come, because, therefore, in the time of Herod, none of the Jewish princes remained. And he, an alien, was the sole ruler. Some thought that he was the Christ, and set on foot this heresy. These, therefore, were the Pharisees trying to kill Christ. Close quote, the afflicate. A couple of things here that I think are very interesting to me. Number one. But the Lord, the Savior of the universe, looked upon them with anger. And that's what it said. It says, quote, looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart. The Lord often has anger in the Gospels. So the next time we are told that it's all about joy and good, goodness and happiness and upbeatness and positivity and And all of these things, let us remember, it is right to be righteously angry sometimes. Not to the destruction of our enemies, but to their salvation, for their total conversion. And it is okay to look upon those that would destroy humankind, those that would corrupt humankind, those that would compel them to mortal sin, and be angry about it. To be angry about the scandals inside and outside this church, because souls are being lost to hell. And we should care about that, just like our Lord does. Our Lord wants to save these Pharisees. Let us also desire what the Lord desires, the salvation of all souls, not just some of them. Let us be angry at the injustices in the world. And furthermore, let us do something about it. Hey, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Ever feel like life's just too much? Maybe it's time for a change. God offers us relief and hope. So if you're feeling like you need more peace today, begin at catholicscomehome.com. I used to wonder if God really cared about me. Then I started praying and going to church. I realized that God in my life was the difference between occasionally being happy and finding lasting joy. If you're looking for something more, check out catholicscomehome.com. Many atheists assert the only real form of knowledge is scientific knowledge, thus excluding any sort of religious knowledge, whether philosophical or theological. Such a belief is called scientism, and it's unreasonable for two reasons. First, it's self-refuting. Its truth cannot be verified by the scientific method. It's a metaphysical proposition, and as such, is not scientific knowledge. But if science can't verify the truth of scientism, well then, scientism itself cannot be a legitimate form of knowledge. In which case, it's self-refuting. Moreover, scientism undermines science as a rational form of inquiry because it denies presupposed philosophical assumptions that are necessary to even do science, such as there's an external world outside the minds of scientists. So to reject God's existence on the grounds that it's not scientific knowledge is simply unreasonable. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 35 past the hour, Mr. Julio Laredo from Tradition, Family, and Property is going to be our guest. He is uh, he's stationed in, in Italy, I think in Milan, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Vatican reopening an investigation into the 1983 disappearance of an employee's daughter there. Uh, why are they reopening this case? What do they hope to accomplish? 
And all of that coming up at 35 past the hour. Do join us if you can. There are lots of stories in the news that are a great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. This morning, I discovered there are fresh rumors spreading all across Europe and now into the United States that since Benedict XVI has passed away, there is a document that's been already drafted. It All it needs is the signature of His Holiness Pope Francis, and it would eliminate the TLM completely or suppress it, let's just say, 99%. Is this true? I don't know. It's a rumor. I certainly hope it's not true. I hope it's completely fake news. Uh, I don't know either way, but it is It is uh, making, making tracks all across the Catholic Church. Here is uh, a little statement from infovaticana.com. I also got this from Robert Moynihan as well and other sources. But here's the infovaticana.com. It says, according to a German blog dedicated to news about the traditional mass, under the heading of Benedict's motto proprio, sumorum pontificum, it is about a new apostolic constitution with which Francis, extremely unhappy with the slow implementation of the traditionis custodis, now finally wants to put an end to the old mass. The formula of an apostolic constitution would be chosen to align with the corresponding constitution, Missy. Ale Romanum of Paul VI, and highlight the the uh, par, uh, the parody of its current regulations with the law of 1969. According to the information sources, the expected constitution contains four main norms. In no church can the traditional mass be celebrated exclusively. The celebration of the traditional mass in any church is prohibited every Sunday. The traditional rite where permitted, will apply only to to the Mass, and in no case uh, to the other sacraments. Finally, every priest is obligated to celebrate Masses according to the Novus Ordo. Uh, that is the rumor. That is the rumor. And again, just rumor. In fact, Robert Moynihan, in his video on his channel, uh, the, inside the Vatican, he talked about how he doesn't normally like to talk about rumors or spread rumors, but because he was seeing it come up in so many sources across Europe that he thought he would share the news that there was a rumor. Interesting because I saw uh, an article, I think it was a Monday I found this, out of The Critic. Joseph Shaw who we've had on this program a couple of times, he wrote this article, this commentary over at The Critic, The Problem of Religious Traditionalists. They wish to pass on the flame. I thought this was a good uh, article to read. I won't read all of it to you. Uh, I'll read a portion of it to you for sure. But I think it kind of gets to the heart of why this is an issue for so many Catholics who desire the tradition and patrimony of Holy Mother Church. That anchor that takes us back to the great saints and to so many centuries into our past, and to live it now, not, to, not as a museum, but to be a living and active and lively uh, participation in this faith that's been handed on by the blood of the martyrs and those witnesses through time. Here's, I'm, I'm going to jump into sort of uh, already in progress into this article from Joseph Shaw. It says, yet there is one area of life where this uncontroversial principle has become very contentious indeed, religious traditionalism. I am most familiar with the Catholic kind, but there is an analogy with debates within Anglicanism. In Unlocking the Church, William White quotes an Anglican cleric with responsibility for church con- uh, conservation. Quote, the three great banes which hold back more effective use of church buildings as an instrument of mission and growth are the following, blocked gutters, bats, and the Victorian society, close quote. The visceral opposition uh, to efforts to preserve the fabric of Anglican Victorian churches has its Catholic parallel with debates about the pre-1969 liturgy. Pope Francis whose office confers upon him the duty to preserve the Catholic Church's traditions, as his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, remarked, the Pope, quote, is the guardian of the authentic tradition, close quote, has condemned even the most subtle mark- markers of liturgical traditionalism, mocking lace trim on vestments, for example, as a homage to grandma. Accusations of e- effemacy 
are not exactly the traditional register of the papal teaching office. Many Catholic commentators of a liturgically progressive inclination have been scarcely more charitable. There are, of course, pastoral and theological issues lurking in the intricacies of compare chancels screens and uh, hiding among the folds of Roman chasubles. White quotes an Anglican architectural writer on one particular place of worship, quote, surely St. Peter's is a church loved by its congregation and no doubt by the Victorian society, but we cannot worship in a free, unfettered, and joyous way whilst fixing into the building like this, close quote. It is a telling remark because the writer admits that the church in question is successful in terms of maintaining an apparently thriving congregation. The question of pastoral success, however, is apparently besides the point. The parishioners of St. Peter, the writer confidently assures us, are not worshiping in a free, unfettered, and joyous fashion. They just can't be. Similarly, a meeting at the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith in Rome, which led to heavy-handed restrictions being placed on celebrations of the traditional Mass in 2021, considers the fact that the annual traditionalists' walking pilgrimage from Paris to Chartres had just been attended by record numbers. 13,000 mostly young, mostly French Catholics had walked 70 miles, accompanied by Gregorian chant, the Rosary, and the Latin Mass. The journalist Diane Montagna reported of one participant in the meeting, quote, he said, we need to get to the bottom of why these young people are attracted to the traditional Mass, and explained to the other present that many of these young people have psychological and sociological problems, close quote. It seems unlikely that the cardinal who said this had met many Chartres pilgrims, but he was still confident that the success of the pilgrims, their pilgrimage must indicate not that traditional spirituality and practices might after all have some pastoral value, but that there are more neurotics and misfits in the French church than previously realized. As theological objections to Victorian architecture or medieval liturgical rites, these are not very profound, but they are typical. More fully argued objections to both do exist, but they vary from one commentator to another, and they are above the heads of most participants in these conflicts. The contrast between a community fo a focused, uh, imminent conception of worship of God with a transcendent, hierarchical, and masculine conception does have currency among anti-traditionalists, but most would be hard put to explain these terms. Even more importantly, supposing it were possible to pin the issue down to a theological principle, it is still not clear why the people on the wrong side of the argument should be regarded with such disdain. It is not as, the, as if either the Anglican or the Roman Church is unused to theological disagreement, or incapable of holding together any single communion people with a range of views. You see, Joseph Shaw is an Englishman and a professor and a traditional Catholic. And so he's comparing and contrasting these parallels, these arguments, these fights for the souls within the Anglican communion of those high Anglicans and the low Anglicans that embrace all manner of crazy and the high Anglicans that want more traditional the look and the feel, the architecture, the smells, the bells, the vestments, they, they, something that feels more, let's just say, Roman. And then that conflict that happens within the Catholic Church of the sim similar nature, those that want to embrace the world as it stands, as it is, and those that want to embrace the tradition of the Holy Mother Church as passed on by the blood of the seed of the martyrs. It's a war for the heart and the soul in some ways. And that's what Joseph Shaw is contrasting and comparing to here. It's very, very interesting. He says, Catholics who want to hear mass in the vernacular can turn up at 99% or more of actual celebrations without fear. The availability of their preferred options, however, it is not enough for militant religious progressives. It would seem they will only be satisfied with the alternatives when all the alternatives have been hunted down and destroyed. 
The last note of Gregorian chant must be drowned out by guitars. The last pew must be dragged outside and sold to a gastro pub. And I think, that, again, that's at the heart of all of this. Alice von Hildebrand once said, the devil hates the ancient mass. He hates it because it is the most perfect reformulation of all the teachings of the church. And I think that's at the heart of all of this. There is no threat from traditional Catholics. When most Catholics have lots of options to go to, holy, to, go to mass in the vernacular near them, traditional Catholics have to sometimes drive an hour, two or three. When I was in New Hampshire, I met Catholics that were driving three hours every single Sunday to go to the TLM mass, a diocesan approved TLM mass, not a rogue community trying to be disobedient, not a community that is out there to cause trouble for his holiness, Pope Francis or Holy Mother Church. Not at all. Not at all. It was a community thriving, busting at the seams, parking lot packed, full of Catholics who love the church, love her tradition, love her patrimony. And guess what? They stayed for hours after mass. They went downstairs and they all went to uh, a giant uh, meeting that they were taught the faith by father who gave them an hour lecture of catechism. And they were all there. Mom, dad, the kids. It was packed house only. And then they didn't even go home after that. No, then they went back upstairs and did Vespers to a packed house. Parking lot full. It was beautiful. It was utterly beautiful to see. But for some odd reason, this has to be done away with. Why are they the enemy? They aren't making anybody else the enemy. It's not as though these traditional Catholics were out there to get every other Catholic. This is a false dichotomy. This is a false war. This is not a real war. This is something nefarious that all Catholics, irregardless of your preference, which mass you go to, should be concerned about. And I think Joseph Shaw in his article, which is pretty lengthy, and you should read it to its full. You can find it at thecritic.co.uk. He says, religious, religious traditionalists have displayed a cockroach-like ability to survive in the most hostile environments. I agree, Joseph. And they will continue to do so in spite of any rumors that are out there that I pray are not, in fact, true. I pray there is no further suppression of the traditional mass of St. Teresa of Avila, Therese of Lisieux, Padre Pio, Max Colbet, so many other incredible saints. Let's pray. We'll be right back. More to come. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever noticed what happens when you try to keep up with the current fashions? You go nuts. When we are obsessed with keeping up with the times, we become slaves. Fashions are never settled. To chase something that is always changing is simply futile. It's not freedom, it's insanity. G.K. Chesterton says, the Catholic Church is the only thing that saves a man from the degrading slavery of being a child of his age. Christianity is always out of fashion because it's always sane, and fashions are always insane. The Catholic Church never has to worry about being behind the times because it is beyond the times. Want more than a minute? Visit our website, chesterton.org. Hey, Donnie, what are the two most important things we receive at Mass? Daddy Christmas scripture. That's right. All right, one more. Who loves you the most? Jesus. That's right. Mary. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they love us too. If you don't educate your children in the faith, who will? Educate yourself and your family by listening daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network. And make sure to get the GRN app by logging online to grnonline.com. 
Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm Rudy Carlos. Here's a couple more headlines for you today. This one's from the Epic Times. Really sad story, actually. Headline is, Newsom's budget includes two doses of opioid overdose medicine for every school. This is coming out of California. While hundreds of schools in the state have already begun to stock naloxone, naloxone, I think, on campuses amid rising opioid-related overdoses and deaths, this year's 108 point $8 billion budget for the K-12 through education budget includes $3.5 million worth of ongoing uh, doses uh, to be provided to the schools. Among the 7,125 opioid-related deaths in California in 2021, 8.5% of those who died were between the ages of 15 and 19, according to the most recent data from the California Public Health Department. And here's a little bit lighter fare from Catholic News Agency. Thief steals St. Michael's statue from church and then trips and is injured by the angel's sword. Local media reported that during the early hours of January 14th, Carlos Alonso, who is 32, allegedly went to Christ the King Parish in downtown Monterrey to rob the church. In the darkness, Alonso reportedly jumped over the fence in front of the church entrance, broke a glass door, and entered the church. While trying to flee with a statue of St. Michael the Archangel, the alleged thief tripped and fell on the angel's sword, seriously injuring his neck. Monterey civil protection personnel arrived at the scene, cut the padlock on the main gate of the fence, and saved the would-be thief's life. He is expected to be turned over to the public prosecutor's office to face punishment for his crimes. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. Praise be to God in all things. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up today. Joining us right now via Zoom chat is Mr. Julio Laredo, Tradition Family and Property out of Italy. Good morning to you, Mr. Laredo. Good morning to you. Good morning to you all. Yeah, praise be to God. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. Thank you for your time today. Same to you, and thank you very much for inviting me to your radio. Let's talk about this uh, report that came out um, that uh, they're reopening a case from a missing uh, a missing person's uh, crime back in 1983. This young girl, she was, I guess, 15 years old. She was the daughter yes. of an employee living inside the Vatican. Um, how many people live inside the Vatican? Pretty, pretty uh, small number. And she went missing in 1983. And this case has been an ongoing situation there, but they're reopening it now. What is going on with this case? What can we understand from it? Well, thank you very much. Well, first, first, first of all, the Vatican is not actually reopening the case. It's opening it in the sense that it's going to be prosecuted now by the Vatican. Oh. Up, to, up to now, it had been prosecuted by the, the Italian state. And there was a decision, I think, in 2016 or 2017, of the Supreme Court definitely closing the case, that is, rejecting an uh, appeal that the disappeared girl's brother had done. So the case was closed as for the Italian um, law. So what the Vatican is actually doing is opening a, a new case in with the Vatican courts, uh, about the same subject. And this was asked for by the girl's uh, brother, who sent a, a, a personal letter to Pope Francis, hand-delivered to him during a, during a flight, during a plane flight, in one of his trips, to which the Pope answered in a hand-delivered letter on his turn to the uh, Orlandi. The, that's the, that's the, the second name of this girl. I'll tell you the story now. Um, so it was um, after this personal intervention of Pope, of Pope Francis that the case was opened in with the Italian uh, courts and thus reopened in the general sense. Now, what, what was the case? 1983, um, this girl, Emanuela Orlandi, she was a citizen of the Vatican, not only a daughter of an employee of the, of the Vatican, of the governatorato, the governorship of the Vatican. And you ask how many people live there. There are actually quite a few. There are uh, several thousand. Oh, wow. And they, they don't pay certain taxes. They have super uh, shopping centers and uh, low-cost uh, gas. And they have all sorts of um, 
they are paid in cash more uh, most of most of them so it's a it's a big small world of its own and most of them are vatican citizens they have vatican passports and and this girl was a vatican citizen but uh, she 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 went to music lessons uh, concretely uh, flute lessons so she went out she called her uh, parents I'm, I'm i'm going out for the flute and then from the singing lessons there were two consecutive lessons the flute lessons were from five to six the uh, singing lesson was from six to seven she left some minutes before seven and called uh, her family in the vatican saying i'm going to meet with some friends some girlfriends of her same age they were all uh, uh, 15 more or less and she never showed up she never returned their, uh, their parents, especially her father, got worried. They went to the police. The police said, uh, we, we have to wait 24 hours before reporting a missing person. So they waited till the next day, and the missing person report was made. And she never showed up, and this is 1983. Mm. Now, from there, all sorts of investigations have been, have been done. Um, if if uh, someone would would write a book, it will be a, a a thriller that most people would say the imagination of the author is just too flowers. This is too much. Wow! And, but it's all absolutely true. Now, up to now, nobody knows what what happened to Emanuela Orlandi. Uh, so everything that can be said is only a, a hypothesis. Mm. Wow, what a case. So if so much investigations have been done, then what could the Vatican hope to achieve? That's a very, uh, it, it's, um, that's not a million dollar question. I would say it's a trillion dollar <laughs> question in the sense that up to now, the Vatican has uh, denied any collaboration with the investigation. Because, as we will see, the, the investigation touches very deeply the Vatican, of course. When we speak about the Vatican, we don't speak about the Pope and all the cardinals and all the bishops. We speak about people inside the Vatican. The investigations, uh, <clears throat> as they developed, um, they evolve around three, uh, 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 three, uh, three lane, three uh, uh, judicial hypothesis. One of them is that, and this I will explain later, because uh, to my, from my point point of view, this is the more probable uh, hypothesis. There is a band, or there was a band, a criminal band, a mafia, a Roman mafia called La Banda de la Maliana, the Maliana band, and the Vatican was owing money to the Maliana band. So everything, uh, that there are hundreds of, um, how do you say, when, 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 when you have facts that don't prove but indicate a certain path, okay. there are hundreds of, um, they're called the indicios, uh, in Italian, that point towards this fact, that she was kidnapped in order to have leverage with the Vatican to be paid for the debts the per people in the Vatican had with this uh, Maliana band. Oh, wow. The second hypothesis, <clears throat> which I don't know if you've heard of Father Amor, the famous exorcist of uh, Rome. Sure. That mm -hmm. was the hypothesis he believed in, and several lawyers and judges also believe in this uh, uh, hypothesis, is that she was uh, kid uh, kidnapped by a drug and sex uh, uh, gang. Um, inside the Vatican, that is, uh, people ha making this um, uh, drug deals and sex orgies, et, et cetera, inside the Vatican. The third hypothesis, which is the less probable, is that it has to do with the international situation uh, because uh, Pope John Paul II was financing anti-communist uh, associations, Solidarność in Poland, et cetera. And um, supposedly the secret services, the uh, communist secret services, wanted to draw the attention away from that and have 
and is, is an instrument <clears throat> to apply pressure on Pope John Paul II. But the Ger East German Secret Services, the Stasi, have denied this. So this is the least probable um, uh, the hypothesis. So right, uh, right now, the justice will be working with the two standard hypotheses, either a, a mafia situation, a racket situation, or a, a sex and drug situation. Wow. Uh, what will come up, I don't know. But um, most probably she's already dead. <clears throat> I don't know. But <clears throat> what we know is that she was uh, kidnapped and kid, uh, kid, kidnapped by, by, by people belonging to the Maliana band. What is the Maliana band? You know that people speak about mafia in a very generic way. Actually speaking, mafia is the Sicilian mafia. Mm. In Naples, it's called the Camorra. In Calabria, it's called the Ndrangheta. In Puglia, it's called the Sacra Corona Unita. In other places, it... Hold that thought right there. Hold that thought. We have a network break we have to take. A minute and a half from now, we're going to be right back. Continue this conversation. We're going to pick up right there with the mafia theory. Wow. How horrible is that? Let's pray for the repose of Emanuela's soul for sure. And uh, let's talk about the tombs that they dug up as well. All of that and more coming up right after this quick break. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your One Minute Tool for Catholic Evangelism. Here's the question. Should pastors and churches place expectations and obligations on the congregation? Your average non-Catholic evangelical would say no, maybe even no way. It might be said, we do not need written order, discipline, or expectations. Those should derive from personal desire and from the Holy Spirit, not from a church. Or, each Christian's conscience should be sufficient for correction and discipline. Or, the Holy Spirit will personally lead each believer as to what church or to attend and certainly how often they should go. So here's your three best friendships tools for Catholic evangelism. Natural law says human society cannot be well-ordered nor prosperous unless it has legitimate authority to preserve its own institutions, the Bible. Secondly, the Bible, which says in multiple places such as Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you. And thirdly, the Catholic Church says when we are properly ordered, we will be capable of resisting conformity to the contemporary demands of unhealthy individualism. So obligations, much obliged. From the University of Dallas and as seen on EWTN. What can I do that is the definite service that God wants me to give to the world? Think of the, the challenges that we have coming from our culture. We really need the virtue of courage. Are you ready to put yourself into the hazard? Are you ready to say yes to the call? Are you ready to be a witness to love? The Quest. All episodes streaming now at quest.udallas.edu. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Mr. Julio Laredo, Tradition Family Property, is our, our guest. He's in Italy. Milan, I think. Is that right, Mr. Laredo? It, yes, in Milan. Yeah. Beautiful. Praise be to God. We're talking about this 1983 disappearance of this young woman. Uh, who remains a mystery, and we were just we were right at the break, and you were talking about this. Uh, the prevailing theory is that the mafia kidnapped her, and so maybe you could pick up there. You were saying this is the Sicilian mafia strain. You were giving us some background there. No, uh, <clears throat> as I was saying, people um, people tend to speak about mafia in a very generic way. I see. Um, concrete, uh, uh, concretely speaking, the mafia, but properly speaking, mafia is the Sicilian mafia. Ah. Then there are other rackets because mafia exists everywhere, even without a name. Now, in Rome, there was a, a band of crooks who did services to the other mafias, especially to the Albanese mafia, uh, who was controlling all the drug tra trafficking in Rome. Mm. Um, this is the 1970s. And this band of crooks, they were doing services, quotations, to these uh, rackets. At a certain point, they decided to form themselves the Roman Mafia, but it, the Roman Mafia didn't actually uh, exist. And they formed a band that the media baptized as the Maliana Band. Maliana because that's a neighborhood of Rome where most of the leaders uh, of this racket, of, of this Mafia, lived, including the, uh, the boss, uh, Enrique de Pedis. 
Well, when they began to do things on their own, I mean, when they began to extort from um, from businessmen and they began to kidnap and kill, etc., immediately they were summoned by some Vatican people, and um, they were they were told, "Hey, uh, this is not the Far West. We have to coordinate things among ourselves." So they perceived that. Unknowingly to them, there were, let's, let's call them structures of power in Rome, which were, of course, were not those of the state, which, with, with which they had to deal. And this all got to be known because the boss, Enrique de Pedis, had a, a very young, I think she was at the time underage, um, a girlfriend, a, a girl called Minardi, and uh, they broke, and Minardi began to be to collaborate with the uh, with the uh, police. With Milan, began to collaborate with uh, with uh, just uh, Italian justice. And even though some things she said were not correct, most of the things she said were correct. And she described, for example, through her, they found the car that had been used for the kidnapping. Oh wow! They found the place in London, London, where the uh, Orlandi was kept. The girl Emanuela Orlandi was kept for many years. Mm. They discovered the bank. How do you call it transferals? You know the bank. Um, yeah. The transferals Transactions. Yeah. From the Vatican Bank Whew. to the sisters. Uh, don't remember what order in London, uh, in order to feed the girl to lodge the girl, et cetera. So they were earmarked for a certain guest this, uh, this uh, uh, sister school had wow. in London. So through Minardi woman, um, they actually managed to find many concrete real elements. And she said that it was her who took the money to the Vatican. They even asked her, well, did you go to Monsignor such a... Uh, apartment and say yes. Describe it. So we say, well, there's a corridor, there's a wa- bathroom on the right, etc. So she knew perfectly well all this uh, situation. And according to her, what was known within the the uh, ambiences of this Maliana band is that she had been kid, uh, uh, kidnapped in order to uh, have a leverage against the Vatican because of a of a great of a big debt. The Vatican Institute had with them, had with the with this band. This all intermingles in a very, I don't know how to call it, in an unbelievable thriller way, with remember the killing of banker Michele uh, Sindonia, mm. the suicide of the banker Calvi under Blackfriars Bridge in London. Mm-hmm. The crack of the uh, Banca Ambrosiana, etc. There's a whole lot of elements which are absolutely dark. They are absolutely mysterious. But up to now, as I said, the hypothesis the justice was working with that had the most elements of truth in it was this. Now, at a certain point, someone calling himself a. Uh, 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 excuse me, not calling himself, the media called him, him L'Americano, mm-hmm. he began to call and give information about the case. And analyzing his voice, analyzing his accent, analyzing the structure of the phrases, it's a person of Anglo-Saxon background who had Latin as his, as his second la- language and Italian as his third la- language, and knew, per, per, uh, knew perfectly well the Vatican. And most of the, uh, of the judges that have dealt with this think, it's all the hypothesis, it's an alleged, um, think that it was Bishop Marcis, uh, Marcinkus, wow. who, as we know, was head of the, uh, of, of the Vatican's bank. And he gave, uh, anonymously, there was no cell phones back then, so they couldn't be traced, um, anonymously, he, he gave several, uh, um, several information that were true, 
several information that were false. For example, the, uh, the finding of, of, of the body in the uh, Teutonic Cemetery in the Vatican, the founding of the body in the Santa Polinare Basilica in Rome, etc. Those uh, tips uh, turned out to be false. So, as I said, it's a mystery. Hmm. Everything I'm saying here has not been yet uh, affirmed by the courts. So I always put in everything that I've said up to now, I put a big question, question mark. But this is the hypothesis. This is the uh, reconstruction of the facts with which the it, it, Italian justice was always working without receiving any type of collaboration from the Vatican. There were several attempts to involve the Vatican in the Italian court's investigation, and they met with a stone wall. Mm. So what changed now is that Pope Francis opened, as I said, not reopened, but opened the case with the Vatican justice. Why did he do it? What was I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really don't know because this would be to judge uh, intentions, and that is clearly impossible. Wow. Mr. Loretta, what a story. Thank you for sharing that with us. You know, I'm, I'm questioning, though, the, the one thing that reminds that remains in my mind, you know, there's so many questions I'd like to ask about this, but we're kind of sh short on time here. But I'm wondering, she apparently lived in this in this uh, this community with with nuns. Is that correct? Yes. So there was a there was a time where she I don't know, she probably could have escaped or she was being held there. I guess the theory is against her will and, and she probably died there. She probably died, died there. And what I've read uh, so is, is that she actually was was kept drugged oh. and, and it eventually dried, uh, died. Wow. Now, what happened was that one by one all the leaders of this Maliana band were hunted down and killed by unknown killers, including the boss, Enrico de Peris, whom we know uh, was uh, buried in a pontifical basilica, in San Apollinare Basilica, so much that the rector of San Apollinare Basilica is now uh, in jail for uh, collaboration with the mafia. And um, this, this was a scandal that exploded in 2014, I, I think, that, uh, and he was taken out of that basilica. Wow. And then they dug deeper because they, they thought that they would also found Emanuela's body, and they didn't find, well, they found skeletons, but they, had, they found several things, but they were much, they were much, much older. So up to now, nobody knows um, mm -hmm. if she's still alive, but most probably she's not. And one of these anonymous sources, because along the, the process, the, the, there, there have been several anonymous sources that have called the um, uh, police and the uh, justice department. And one of them say, said that Emanuela had been cremated. <clears throat> now, as, as I said, uh, nobody knows anything. Hmm. But they have found the car with which she was uh, uh, kidnapped. They have found the, the uh, receipts of the bank transferals from the Vatican to London uh, for this pur purpose. And they have found all sorts of um, uh, circumstantial facts that wow. point in that uh, direction. Now, what happened in 2016 or 17 was that the Supreme Court of Italy decided or ruled that they said all these uh, circumstantial uh, facts didn't make one case. So it was closed. Whoa. Now the Vatican is reopening it on wholly new basis with the Vatican justice. Let me ask you a quick question. We are running out of time here very quickly, but if in fact the Vatican paid uh, uh, some money to as a, like a ransom, would there would that not have needed the approval of John Paul II in order to pay that money out? Look, the actual power the Pope has on the finances of the Vatican is very small. You see the case, nothing to do with this, but just as an example, 
when Pope Benedict <clears throat> put as head of the IOR, IOR, the Vatican Bank, his intimate friend and man of confidence, Ettore Gotti Tedeschi, he was literally thrown out of the IOR against Pope Benedict's will. Wow. And Pope Benedict's will couldn't do anything to prevent it. So there's a so good chance this had the, nothing to do with JP2. No, no, no. I'm just saying this, this episode with Benedict has nothing to do with all that. But I mention it just as a, to, to, to show sure. yeah. how little power the Pope actually has yeah. on what goes on on the financial level. Wow. The well, we're out of time. Mr. Julio Laredo, great. Thank you for sharing this information with us on this story. We're going to be praying for justice and truth to come out. Mr. Julio Laredo, Tradition Family Property. God bless you. God love you. Have a great day, sir. God bless you, and thank you very much for, uh, for this invitation, and God bless you all. All right, coming up in the next hour, the game show, the after show, and so much more. GRNonline.com forward slash CDT. This is a Messy Family Minute with Mike and Alicia Hearn. Sometimes it can seem that our family life is humdrum, monotonous, and insignificant. But Christ began his public ministry at the wedding at Cana. When we read this account in the gospel, we're reminded that our marriage, our ordinary family life, is important to God. Our Lord and Our Lady love our families, and they are present with us. They desire to change what is ordinary into the extraordinary. The Lord can take our simple and everyday tasks and make them holy. Like the servants at the wedding at Cana, we need to notice when we run out of wine, when we run out of joy, when we run out of love. It is then that we turn to Our Lady and ask for her help. She can bring Christ into our lives, our ordinary water, and transform it into wine. And when we invite Christ into our lives to transform us, He creates the best wine of all. For more advice, ideas, and encouragement, visit us at MessyFamilyProject.org. The rule of St. Benedict has guided monastic communities for nearly 1,500 years. One Minute Monk, Abbot Placid Solari of Belmont Abbey. Benedictine monks still use the book every day to order our daily lives. So what's the secret to the rule's vitality? Moderation and flexibility. St. Benedict calls it a little rule for beginners. Since we're really all beginners, the rule is as relevant for you as it is for monastic communities. It helps us believe I can be holy too. The rule is also flexible. St. Benedict makes it clear that everything takes a back seat to the guiding principle of saving souls. In St. Benedict's rule, the goal is holiness. For your free copy of the rule of St. Benedict, visit oneminutemonk.com. O-N-E minutemonk.com. Remember, holiness is the end point, not the place where most of us start. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here. And every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. I guess, there, I mean, Netflix did a whole thing on that story. Yes, that's right. Some are attributing this uh, Netflix docuseries mm-hmm. to be the reason why mm-hmm. the case is being reopened. I, I think there was also, uh, I guess they think there's precedent here, but there's a, an audio series. I forget what it's called. Maybe you know what it is, but it's like a true crime docuseries, or not docuseries, uh, an audio podcast. Oh, yeah. That reopened another case mm-hmm. where uh, a guy was acquitted for his crime. So Wild. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting story, Mr. Julio Loretto is such a great storyteller on this. Wow. The power of media. Holy here. moly. Yeah. yeah. So you can get the podcast of that conversation we just had with Mr. Julio Loretto on uh, on this case being opened by the Vatican. Um, I hope they find I hope they find the records that like prove this and let yeah, justice some closure for the closure family. for the family, exactly. I still don't get why. I still don't get it. Yeah. Why well, I, he said the prevailing theory is there are bad actors at the Vatican Bank owed money to these criminals, and they were going to get their money. 
one way or the other. And yeah. the way criminals do business is through crime. So they kidnapped this young girl and she paid the Crazy. price. But you know what really, what really, I mean, this is the, the reason I asked Mr. Loretto is uh, this, this community of nuns, they must have known what the deal was with this girl. She's being drugged. That, every see, day. that's the part so that's really Are they confusing. collaborating? How do you... How how did hmm how, that doesn't make any There's sense? So many to me. questions. Is that there makes no so sense. many questions? Is there a, a false sense of obedience? Okay, well the, the it, cardinal has asked me to do it. I'm going to do. What cardinal it. could ask you to to yeah. hold a girl against or, her will? Or maybe maybe they like, told that's her that's not a thing. I mean, nobody to be, can ask you to be charitable to the, to the sisters, happen. right? I would yeah. say like okay, well maybe they were lied to. They were saying oh you know oh, this little this sick. young girl no she's she's a drug addict. Oh, uh -huh. she just, you know, she is. So can you all take care of her? And right. we're going to try to get her yeah, help. Exactly. And so the, the sisters are thinking that she, I have no idea. I'm literally just making this up. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like, to give them the most <laughs> the charity the doubt, yeah. possible, that's the most charitable thing I could come up with. I don't yeah, know. I don't know. Story. It's crazy. What a, story. what a crazy. And the Vatican Bank is just... Like, should we just nuke the thing and start over? I mean, it's every pontificate. I mean, even the Godfather movies made fun of the Vatican Bank. Yeah. Because it's just they can't seem to fix this thing. Do you know, allegedly, no Al pope Al has been able to fix this uh, thing. Converted on his deathbed? Who? Al Capone. Uh, I don't know if I've ever heard huh? that. Yeah, apparently he uh, hmm. he uh, repented and he had on his gravestone, have mercy on me, a sinner, wow. uh, put on his gravestone. Well, good for and him. And he was anointed in 1947. So hey, you would convenient. say... Saint Al Capone, then yeah, possibly like it's Constantine. Possible. Do the do the Eastern Orthodox consider Al Capone a saint? I'm just curious. <laughs> the Eastern Orthodox, they're like, no, no, but not because of him being a mafia, because he was a Sicilian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely dead to us. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Well, again, you can catch the podcast of our conversation, with Mr. Julio Laredo, about this case uh, on the uh, GRN mobile app, which is the Guadalupe Radio Network. You can search for it in your iOS or your Android app store. Just download that; it's free. You can catch the, the podcast, uh, which is up about an hour after the show. You can also find it on our website at grnonline.com. Speaking of podcasts, real quick, though, guess what I learned yesterday? What? Uh, a guest who had been on this program a couple of times, Father Carlos Martins, okay. has launched uh, a podcast of his own, but oh, yeah. through iHeartRadio. Uh, not that I want to plug iHeartMedia so much, but but Father Carlos Martins, for sure. It's called The Exorcist Files, and apparently the Vatican asked him to do this. Mm. So he has created a podcast that's done like in a docudrama type of style, where they've taken certain some of his exorcist cases, and they dramatize bits and pieces of it so that wow. they, he could teach like a catechesis on exorcism, demonology, you know, the occult, things like that. Better him than all the mass of young ladies who do that and uh, exploit yeah. all of these stories oh my, oh for, for views and just completely throw out crazy theories about what the church does. Yeah. It's, uh, that's good. It's good apologetics there. We yeah. should get Father Carlos, Carlos back on to talk that's about his new uh, podcast, The Exorcist Files. Sure. I'm looking forward to checking it out myself. So The Exorcist Files, you can check that out. And by the way, uh, when you win the brand new Mercedes, I guess it comes standard with Apple CarPlay, which Ooh. means you can listen to the show streaming on your GRN app. What if you have an Android? Or the, or the podcast. Uh, then you should repent and believe in the gospel. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it does Bluetooth, and you'll be able to connect yeah, your, your sure. mobile, whatever, whatever it is, into the dashboard of your brand new 2023 CLA 250, which you could win from the Guadalupe Radio Network on February the 24th. But you got to act fast if you want to get in on it. You get $25 a ticket. You can get five for $100. Go to grnonline.com forward slash raffle for the rules, and you can purchase your raffle tickets there fast and secure online. grnonline.com forward slash raffle raffle or call your local GRN station manager and ask them how you might get your tickets to uh, possibly win a brand new Mercedes in polar Burr. white. I see. Polar white. Polar. Praise be to God. I can't wait to see who wins that. Um, all right. Well, uh, the, I'm going to, I have a top 10. Okay. But this one, only Adrian can answer. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh boy. Adrian has to get all 10 right. Uh oh. Or else. What's his punishment? 
he has to clean my garage. Yeah, Ooh. okay. <laughs> Are you telling me your garage isn't organized? <laughs> it needs some it needs some freshening. Oh. It's spring cleaning. I've seen his garage. Uh-huh. It's not possible to clean. <laughs> There's no nothing nowhere to put anything. There's, it has to true. just be throwing things in the trash. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> garages are functional spaces. Mm-hmm. They're not storage areas. They're totally storage How areas. How many times do I have to say? If you've ever looked in Joe's garage, it's, then you would you I, doubt that that I, theory. Speaking of garages, I have a family member who spent, uh, I'm embarrassed to say this, mm-hmm. they spent $5,000 to have somebody come and organize their garage. They said, how much? $5,000. Joe, for $5,000, I am available fix to, your garage. I am available to organize <sighs> people, people's garages for five grand. 5000 Joe? <laughs> you give it to me, I'll be at your house later today. The I'll, worst part of it I'll is that, my own for five. Uh, the worst part of it is I did it for free twice. For them, <laughs> uh, so. Third time's a charm, as they yeah. say. Well, so come on over. All right, the top 10 greatest boxers of all time. Oh, no, this is going to be bad. Top 10. Okay. Corrugated boxes? Do I have to get or... it in order? <laughs> uh, There's no way I'm going to get this in right. order. I'm going to go I'm going to go down the list. Okay. okay. Coming at number okay. 10, who would you say would be the 10th on the <sighs> top 10? We got to hurry I don't too. Know. You don't I have don't all know. day. Mike Lewis. No, uh, no. Roy Jones Jr. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. sense. That makes <laughs> sense. Number Captain 10. Hook. Uh, he's a former professional boxer, boxer commentator, boxer trainer. I like rapper, him. I listen to his commentary. Rapper and actor. Did you he's have, a rapper? Do you have his albums? No, definitely not. <laughs> his LPs? Definitely not. Yikes. Uh, coming in at number nine on the top ten greatest boxers of all time. You won't guess this one. Okay. No way. Who is it? Uh, Henry Armstrong. Yeah, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of him. Never heard of Henry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong uh, held the 125, 135, 147 titles at the same time and just missed winning the 160 crown by points. So, Henry Armstrong. Coming at number so eight, lightweight. somebody who was huge when I was young. Okay. Sugar Ray Leonard. He's number eight? Huh. Number eight on the I list. feel like he should be higher. Really? Yeah. Number eight. Dude, he's amazing. Sugar Ray Leonard. Wow. Great guy. Uh, best known as Sugar Ray Leonard is an American former professional boxer, motivational speaker, and I like this one, occasional actor. Yeah, that makes sense. On occasion. What do you want to do today? I, I, feel I like don't it. know. I'm willing to put money that they, uh, they paid him to like be an extra you as like, a boxer act? in a boxing movie. <laughs> I mean, the they occasional. They did that to a ton of boxers. <laughs> occasional. I, he's played himself in several things. Oh, uh, okay. You know, so, and that's easy. It's like when Donald Trump played himself in that's Mike Tyson. The every presidency. Movie, every movie Mike Tyson's in, he uh, <laughs> or Home Alone. Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in at number seven, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Okay, I, uh, that's fine. It's number seven. Uh, he could be there. <laughs> why is I, why is that fine? I, I mean, he is one of the greats. Uh, I wouldn't put him near in the top five. You wouldn't? No. Mayweather, no way. the one who still boxes. He doesn't really still box, but kind of. He does like uh, demos, does exhibition exhibitions. matches. Yeah. 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 Hmm. I put him down like number eight. Isn't probably. he like the most winningest? Like money? No. Money oh, wise? Yeah, money wise, yeah. He is the richest uh, boxer ever. Isn't that his nickname? Yeah, Money Mayweather. Money Mayweather. It used Mayweather. to be Pretty Boy yeah. Mayweather, but he changed it to Money Mayweather mm-hmm. after he mm-hmm. like revolutionized making money in, in boxing. Yeah. How yeah. much does he pay to clean his garage? Ooge money. <laughs> ooge, ooge cash. Dude. All right, coming in at number six, again, old school. Like, think back your grandpa's time frame. Okay, uh, what weight class? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's like, there's just so many. Just, there's just so make it up. Options. Just make it up, Joe. <laughs> there's the information is not quite as readily available as I would have loved from this top ten list. Pound of feathers weight. <laughs> it's just, uh, but we're talking we're, the black and white era. Black and white era. Mm-hmm. Rocky Marciano. Oh no, actually, he did not make the top ten. What? Joe Lewis <laughs> made the top okay, ten. Okay, Joe Lewis deserves six. Okay. Oh, I Joe Lewis deserves to be Lewis, on there. Joe Lewis. Lewis, the greatest boxer. Rocky both Mar- in and out of the ring, 25 title defenses pre-retirement. He was only defeated once and averaged the defeat in a, uh, avenged the defeat rather, in a first round KO. Dang. What about George Foreman? Mm, did not oh. make the top 10. What? Really? Yeah. What? Neither did Frazier, I think. Wow. Uh, uh, okay, I lied a second ago. Okay, so Rocky Marciano I is on the list. Lied to you. <laughs> <laughs> Total fake news. Because coming in at number five is Rocky Marciano, 
And is he the guy that Rocky is based on? He is the guy Rocky is based off of. Okay. The guy was known as one of the greatest punchers of all time, mm -hmm. and like he would get beat up so bad, mm -hmm. and he just would keep going. He was like a train. It was it was pretty amazing to watch him. Yeah, uh, he retired at forty nine and zero. <laughs> that's that's fairly hey, good. Forty nine and zero, and that's in heavyweight because mm -hmm. Mayweather is fifty and zero, mm -hmm. and uh, that's in heavyweight and. That was back whenever rounds were the, the a boxing fight went fourteen rounds. What a forty nine KD fourteen rounds? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Like fourteen you, fifteen rounds. 15. All you had to you drag your arm off the off the <sighs> bench. Crazy. You couldn't even Crazy. raise them. That's what they had to get that rid of that because people were getting Ooh. brain damage. Man, oh man. All right, coming at number four. Who'd you guess? Um, not an American. Mm, not an American. That doesn't narrow it down at all. <laughs> oh. What about uh, Canelo? Canelo? Uh, nah, he's not going to be on the list. He, yeah, he's too young. Yeah, he's too young. Mm. He's too young. Maybe in a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm, Number four. Not an American. Number four. Not an American. Not an American. Hey, wasn't Ooh. Oscar De La Renta? No. De La Renta? Oscar De La Hoya? De La Hoya. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oscar De La Hoya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Oscar De La Hoya. That's a good guess. Yeah. Uh, I'm still waiting for number four. No, not Oscar De La Hoya? Hmm. Not oh. Ox, uh, Oscar De La um, Hoya, no. Who uh, didn't Julio, make the uh, Cesar Chavez. No, Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao? Okay, Dude, I like Manny Pacquiao. Manny lost to Floyd Mayweather and still made it higher in the list. He's a better fighter. Woo. He's a way better fighter. Uh, he deserves to be higher than Mayweather, but if... If... Julio says our is not on the list. I'm going to lose it. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> uh, Manny Pacquiao has won 12 major world titles, by the way. Yeah. Pretty he's decent pretty boxer. Pretty decent. And he yeah. still fights. Really? Yeah. I thought he retired. Supposedly no. Catholic. No he, no, he left the faith. He oh, no. He, he apostatized, and he became a Freemason. Not good. Not good. All right, coming in at number three. Okay. Who would I say? Is the greatest who would fighter you of say? all the time, Mike Tyson? Of course. <laughs> so this list is three? obviously heretical because okay. they put Tyson at number three. Muhammad Ali is number one, obviously. <laughs> um, here, who did they put number two? Uh, Mike Tyson. Hello, don't pass up Mike Tyson so quickly, okay? Everybody knows the, who Mike Tyson. The guy is. needs more time. He was the number one championship fighter at the age of mm -hmm. twenty-one or something like that. Twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Yeah. Four months and twenty. Uh, he was twenty-two years old. I think when he peaked, he, he resigned the undisputed world heavyweight champion and holds a record as the youngest boxer. Yeah, so makes sense. Mike Tyson. Youngest uh, world champion boxer. Yeah, yeah, Mike Tyson. What a guy. All right, coming at number two. Again, black and white. Okay. Uh, you said it's not Sugar Ray Leonard. Mm. Uh, sort of like a Sugar Ray, though. You know what? You're right That's Sugar time. Ray Robinson. Yes, it is. I get them confused all the time. I was thinking yeah. Sugar Ray Robinson earlier when yeah, I said he that. he retired in 65. That's right. That makes sense. He retired in 65. So Sugar Ray Robinson. That makes sense. Coming in. Muhammad Ali. <laughs> number one. Muhammad Ali. You, I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count. Okay. Uh, Mike Tyson, uh -huh. Sugar Ray Robinson, uh -huh. Muhammad Ali. <laughs> yeah. Muhammad Ali. Floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Yeah, he's awesome. Man! Muhammadan, but awesome. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, coming in at number one, is the greatest boxer of all time. Adrian boxes. If you didn't get that, Adrian's a boxer. So, there you go. Hey, let's play the game. Let's have some more fun and learn a few things along the way. That phone number is open, 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. Call right now. Don, why do Catholics confess their sins to a priest rather than going directly to God? Because that's the way God set things up for us to receive his forgiveness. In James 5.16, God, through sacred scripture, commands us to confess our sins to one another. Scripture does not say confess your sins straight to God and only to God. It says confess your sins to one another. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, Jesus tells us that he was given authority on earth to forgive sins. And then scripture proceeds to tell us in verse 8 that this authority was given to men, plural. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus says to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. How did the Father send Jesus? Well, we just saw in Matthew 9 that the Father sent Jesus with the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now Jesus sends out his disciples as the Father has sent him. So what authority must Jesus be sending his disciples out with? The authority on earth to forgive sins. And listen to the next two verses. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
Why would Jesus give the apostles the power to forgive or retain sins if he wasn't expecting folks to confess their sins to them? That's crazy. And how could they forgive or retain sins if no one was confessing their sins to them? The Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another. It also tells us that God gave men the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus sends out his disciples with the authority on earth to forgive sins. When Catholics confess our sins to a priest, we are simply following the plan laid down by Jesus Christ. He forgives sins through the priest. It is God's power, but he exercises that power through the ministry of the priest. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network, radio for your soul. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. (laughs) The Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling, a Catholic trivia game show that has secrets and agendas. Just ask Twitter. They'll tell you. But nonetheless, there are a few things we like to do here on the show. But what we need most is a call on the line to play the game. Would you like to play? You could win. It's possible. Call right now. 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. 9424. That phone number is wide open to the first caller to play the game at 877-757-9424. There are some things we do here on the download the QT. We just don't tell anybody, but we very sneakily try to teach the faith. We look for teachable moments in the questions where you might learn something you didn't know before. Praise be to God. It's always good to learn. We like to have a laugh, a good time when our callers make that call at 877-757-9424. First call gets to play the game at 877-757-9424. Then, of course, we give out prizes, which means it's a winner for everybody because you could learn, you could laugh, and you could win. But you do have to call 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. 9424. The kicker is the secret sauce is we don't ask the caller the questions. They don't need to know. They may not know, but they could still win because I'll ask Rudy, I'll ask Adrian. One of which will give us a correct answer, the other will give us an incorrect answer. The call will have to decide who do they trust more. Then they go into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Rudy, what could they win? Praise be to God. Our sponsor this week is Blessed Catholic. Blessed Catholic collects and restores antique medals, medallions, rosaries, and other items, giving them new life for your devotions. Please make sure to check out their Etsy page as well as connect with them on Facebook. The winner this week is going to receive a handmade St. Francis pocket rosary, which I believe is a one-decade rosary, which features a sterling silver crucifix and white glass beads. It's a beautiful rosary. Thank you so much, Blessed Catholic, for giving giving us something to give away this week. You can check out their Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Blessed Catholic. Make sure to connect with them there. And if you want to see their wares, go to etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash Blessed Catholic. Thank you so much. All right. Praise be to God. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, It's going to be a stiff competition today. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the phones. Max, good morning. Good morning. Praise be to God. Max, how are you? Great. Hey, where, I know I've several times before. Where are you calling from? Remind us. Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. The mighty, Houston. beautiful, frigid. Hey, down, hold it down. What is it like? Uh, what is it? It's like a very frigid 65 75. degrees or something? At the GRN, we, uh, I am the only native Houstonian. Uh, you, you are. That's true. Max, where do you go to church? Catholic Church, Medicine. All right. Praise be to God, Max. Well, we're glad you're back on the show. Hopefully, uh, hopefully life is going very well, as you said, in Houston traffic and uh, make your way through the, the crowds today. But are you ready to play, good sir? I am. All right, let's do this. We're going to start with Rudy Carlos, church-approved tradition. It's been approved. I called, I asked. 
Um, yeah. But well, to, we had to make a few deals with... The, yeah, like, apparently throwing out your tie the is mafia, one of the deals we made. Yeah, the mafia said, like, don't wear ties around here. Like, you're you know? allowed to have some traditions, just not the tie? Because it's right. gone. It's d- gone. Yeah. You're still wearing sweaters. It's already midsummer here in Houston, <laughs> and you're you're wearing a sweater. Thanks be to God, you know, it's warm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cold snap didn't mm-hmm. kill the wildflowers I planted for my daughter. I see. So life is good here in Houston. Some would say it's shady. It's is suspect. It? Sus, as the kids Sus, say? Sus, as the kiddies say today. Okay. All right. Well, let's see how this goes. Anyway, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Which pope ruled for only 22 days? 22 days. Such a short pontificate of John Paul I. Huh. Pray for us. There's a cultist. Isn't he a servant of God? Yeah. Isn't he? No, he's a blessed. He's, he's a blessed now. He's already a blessed? Yeah. yeah. Man. Time flies. Yeah. All right. So you're saying blessed John Paul I. That's right. All right. I wonder what Adrian's going to say. Adrian, could you help me? I know that you specialize in short things. Could you tell me which pope ruled for only 22 days? Yes, the uh, the pope who ruled for only 22 days mm-hmm. was Pope Marcellus II. Really? Which, now that I'm thinking about it and saying it out loud, there's a lot of alliteration right there. Pope Marcellus II ruled for 22 days. I guess not. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, grammar lesson? I don't know. All, All right. right. Give, me t- give me 40 minutes to try to figure out how that works. Uh, I'll, 40 minutes. All right. So Max, in the meantime, you got options here. This is a tricky question, to be honest with you. Which pope ruled for only 22 days? Was it... Marcel, Marcellus the second, as Adrian says, or John Paul the first, as Rudy suggests. Fifteen seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Max, what say you? Well, I believe it is Adrian. Wow! wow. <laughs> Way to go, man! I would have definitely got Way that wrong, Max. Yes, what a wise guy. JP no the way. first, the world for thirty-three days. Yeah, he nailed so it. He knew. Tricky, Max knew. Max. <laughs> Buddy, that was great. I would have gotten that wrong. There'd have been yeah. no way to get it. Like, right. oh, short pontificate, John Paul first. Who else? <laughs> like, I didn't even know who Marcellus was. Like, wow. All right, well done, Max. <laughs> Praise be to God. Uh, unfortunately great, great, great. for you, though, you did have to admit Adrian was correct. My deepest, sincerest apologies to you, Max. Uh, hopefully you can make confessions soon. But nonetheless, let's see if we can't get you in there for uh, a, a twofer. We're going to go to Adrian first for this one. Adrian, can you tell me, what is the term for a few days withdrawal from the world and worldly affairs to pursue solitude, self-examination, prayer, and amendment of life. What do we call that? Well, yes, as someone who has a PhD in amendment of life. Oh, yes, I I see. I'm a professional Uh at at such such things. Got it. Uh, That would be called a retreat. A A retreat. retreat. Which I'm sure Max has been on many retreats. I thought retreat was bad. As a Marine, we're told retreating is bad. Um, It's it's, it's a strategic retreat. (laughs) Unless, yeah, okay, we did we did that's we were retreat. told that that's okay yeah, yeah strategic so. we fought <laughs> our way we're, out we're, is fine we are retreating in order to ready ourselves to go back into the world that is okay yeah, uh, I that's right. all right so that's what let's I did just with see California. let's double check <laughs> let's double let's get a second opinion max here uh, uh, rudy maybe you could shed some light on this topic could you tell me what is the term for a few days withdrawal from the worldly affairs to pursue solitude self-examination prayer and amendment of life well, at the Cowboy Church, we call that backpacking. <laughs> really? Simple times. Is that like a theological term? or? Yeah. <laughs> now, if it's a Cowboy Church, are you required to backpack via horse? Absolutely. <laughs> or would a mule suffice? No, you have to take a horse and all the cows. You have to round, or you have to round up oh, all the cows. Oh, to drive. To drive them it's a ca- into the backpacking. Just like the Lord drives us to salvation, exactly. we drive the cow. I got it. Get along, little dog. <laughs> all right. That's right. All right, Max, you got options here. What is the term for a few days withdrawal from worldly affairs to pursue solitude, self-examination, prayer, and amendment of life? Rudy says it's called a backpacking at the Cowboy Church, whereas Adrian goes with retreat. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Max, what say you? I think that's a good idea. I think that that would be great, just backpacking and going out, but... (laughs) 
It is Adrian. It's correct. Oh! Max! Way to go, Max. Way to go. Max. Max. You know, Max, oh. when you go with Adrian, it's scientifically proven. Try the capital S, <laughs> trademark with E. You get Max. smarter, faster, Max. stronger, more attractive. It's well known. It's well known. I feel, I feel it already. I feel it already. <laughs> See? Proven. Trust my anecdotal evidence. <laughs> Max, I, I'm starting to notice a trend here. Uh, you have uh, twice in a row said Adrian is correct. I'm very oh. concerned about your your salvation and stuff, Max. Uh, <laughs> oh, is that a Nacho <laughs> Libre <laughs> reference? I'm going to be praying for you today. Let's see if we can get you in there That's for a third a straight correct answer, because retreat was the right answer, just for clarity's sake. The retreat was the right answer. But all right, question number three. Back to Rudy. Rudy, can you tell me? This one's a hard one. Oh, I'm Please bracing. Take a moment. I'm bracing myself. Okay. Is faith one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit? You're telling me I have a 50-50 shot of answering <laughs> this right. Okay, I'm going to go with uh, yes. It is. You identify with yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting choice. My pronouns are yes. I see. Okay. Adrian, uh, maybe you might help us with this one. Could you tell me, is faith one of the fruits of the Holy Ghost? Well, that sounds like a trick question to me, Joe. It sure does. It, it does sound like yeah. a trick question. So, you know, I'm going to go with, there's no such thing as fruits of the Holy Spirit. They're called, they're called gifts of the Holy Spirit. Wow. So, no, obviously not. It's a trick My question. They don't even exist. Alone. It's not such a thing. Are you serious? That's what I'm going with. Ooh, man. All right, Max. All right, you got options here. Is faith one of the fruits of the Holy Ghost? Adrian says, no, it's fake news. It's all a lie to manipulate you. Uh, and Rudy says, yes. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Max in Houston, Texas, well, what say you? Adrian, is somebody twisting your arm? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Rudy! I Rudy! No fooling Max today. Max. No fooling. So wise. So what a wise, wise. guy. It's crazy. In fact, yes, it is. It is one of the fruits of the Holy Ghost, and Adrian was wrong. Whoa, what kind whoa. of uh, yeah, what kind of fruits do you think? It, what kind of fruit do you think it would be? Probably uh, not a pomegranate. Uh, fruit Pineapple. salad. Yummy, yummy. An apple? The wiggles? No, it's the wiggles. Mm. <laughs> Max, well played. All three right. You did great. Fantastic. Maybe it's a tomato. Tomatoes are fruit. Max, God bless you, sir. Thanks for playing our game and having thank a laugh you, with us. You. We appreciate it. God bless likewise, you, Max. Likewise, likewise. We're gonna put you on hold, but wonderful day, guys. enjoy your time in traffic in Houston, Texas. Hopefully you don't freeze out today. Hey, that's going to do it for the radio side of our show. If you can join us tomorrow, we would love to have you. Uh, R. Davis Yontz is back. We're going to catch up on a lot of the stories concerning U.S. military. That's on the program tomorrow, plus a lot more. But in the after show, maybe I'll share with you some of the greatest boxers who didn't make the top ten list. Hmm. All that and whatever you want to discuss, go to grnonline.com forward slash cdt. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. to be wrong out of charity says Jesus Robles. so true King so true <laughs> yeah. Craig Ta Craig says uh, I hear your eyesight also improves true. and your teeth whiten also to the point the you can lighten up a darkened room with your smile when you choose Adrian it's 100% true <laughs> Do not fact check. Just accept the science. Uh, I will be uh, accepting as gospel and preaching as truth. Or accepting as truth and preaching as gospel. There we go. Uh, too funny. I Very was talking to that, that phrase. Uh, I don't know where it originated from, but I first heard it from mm. a friend of mine, uh, Matt. And he we were chatting about something. And I was like, you know, I don't know if this is true or not. I did think it was just my intuition about this thing. And I told him something. And he was like, hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, accepting as true, preaching as gospel. And ever since then, I was like, I think that's hilarious. You're stealing I say that it. all the time. It's yours yeah. now. It's mine now. 
Ah, oh, wow. Yeah, I would have got that one wrong too, Gunslinger says. I would have definitely chosen JP1. Oh, yeah. For sure. No way. Who no, What years was Marcellus the second? I think he was like one of the first 10 I, popes. I said what years? <laughs> it was uh, 22 days. What, what half of a month <laughs> was Marcellus the second? Let's find out. I think he was like one of the first popes. No, no, no. He's a late pope. 1555. Really? Yep. He was Bishop of Rome, 9th of April to the May 1st, 1555. Wow. Born 22 Marcello. days. Marcello. Serivani he died suddenly. Spanocci. He died suddenly. Uh, he did not die suddenly. <laughs> he lived to a ripe old age of, how old was he actually? He was born and <laughs> he, oh no, he was pretty young when he died. He died at age 53. Wow. Hmm. I wonder, I don't know how he died. Let me find out. Let's yeah. see. Very fascinating now. He reigned for just 22 calendar days. Pope Marcellus ranks the sixth of the 10 shortest reigning popes. Wow. Whew. Ten shortest? Yeah. What were the other shorter ones? <laughs> I don't know. I gotta like go. Now we need a top now. ten list. The shortest, the shortest reigning pontificates. <laughs> it's not 33, apparently. Oh that just hit me like a ton of breaks. So like, wait, a second. wait a second. What did you just say? I had to think about that for a second. Oh my. He uh so he said that night, so let me read this in context. He says he did not want his relative descending on Rome, nor did he want to be enriched beyond station of a member of the nobi nobility. He did not allow his two nephews, Ricardo and Herinius, who lived in Rome under his care to have formal visits. He instituted immediate economics, e no, immediate economies, economies, yeah, in the expenditure of the Holy See on the 28th of April. He was able to receive the Duke of Urbino in audience. And on the 29th of April, the Duke of Ferrara, he also gave audiences to four cardinals, yeah, uh, lists the cardinals, the leaders of the French faction, the recent conclave. That night, he had trouble sleeping, and on the morning of the 30th, he suffered a stroke and slipped into a coma. That night, he died on the 22nd day after his election. He did a lot in 22 days. He wrote a letter to Emperor Charles V, to the Queen Mary I of England, to Cardinal Reginald Pole. Oh, my goodness. He was a busy man for 22 days. Wow. The executive, the exhausting ceremonies con connected with his ascension, the anxieties rising from his office, overexition, his performance on political functions of the Holy Week and the Easter. All right, I gotta, wow. I gotta jump in. Arrest Trudeau now is clearly someone who has no idea what they're talking about in the Rumble chat today. It's one of your typical anti-Catholic people who spend zero time actually trying to understand what the Catholic Church teaches. This is what Fulton Sheen says. There's there's not 100 people who hate the church. They hate what they think is the church. He is a clear example of this. He spreads error around the world to other people who gullibly believe such nonsense. He, for instance, let me quote you from his commentary today. He says, uh, he says that uh, only Jesus, the, only through Jesus can you be saved, not through a virgin. I'm curious, Arrest Trudeau, now, could you point to me where in the Catechism, say, of the Catholic Church, the Council of Trent, or any other official teaching of Holy Mother Church, where it says we are saved through the Blessed Virgin Mary? Because no Catholic ever believes this, not a single one, not even the most uh, uneducated, idiotic Catholic that I know that don't ever learn their faith, like yourself, thinks that they're saved through the Virgin Mary. No, no, no. They believe just like John the Apostle did at the foot of the cross, witnessing our Lord and Savior suffer there for your soul and for mine, listening to the Lord say, behold your mother. And like the Apostle John, who it was good enough for him to accept her into his home that very day, it is good enough for me, who also wants to be a disciple of the one Savior of all mankind, Jesus Christ, to accept his blessed mother into my home. And just like in uh, Revelation chapter 12, when Satan could not even defeat the, this woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and the crown of 12 stars on her head, when he could not defeat her because she is so precious in the eyes of her divine child, the one savior of all humanity, Jesus Christ, the Satan had to come after you and me instead. And what does Revelation 12 tell us? That she intercedes on our behalf the very children of her divine child. If you reject the mother of your savior, I guarantee you're going to have to give an answer for that when you see him at your judgment. 
That is his mama. And if you think for one second he will allow you to insult his mother, you got another thing coming. Because if you allow people to insult your mother, what kind of man does that make you be? No one is saved through the Blessed Virgin Mary, save that she beg her son to give mercy to you, which she is happy to do because she loves you. There's no greater disciple. There's no greater creature than the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the mother of the word incarnate. She is Theotokos, which the church embraced from day one. She was there in the upper room. The disciples gathered around her. And if you reject her, then you are rejecting the Lord who gave her to you. And no Catholic believes they're saved through Mary. None. So if you're going to pretend as though you understand what the Catholic church teaches, do your homework because you have no idea what you're talking about. And Catholics look at people like you and go, Oh, another idiot. And if you're not an idiot, which I, I would have to assume you can't, you shouldn't be, then do your homework and stop espousing error. Good grief. Anyway, you were saying something about Mar- Marcellus the second. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, Joe. <laughs> I don't have, I have no feelings about it otherwise. Oh my I have, goodness. I have really nothing to say. Otherwise. So, yeah, anyway. The uh, in regards to uh, to that, well, with the Jay Cook switched over to Rumble so he could fight too. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Cook mixing it up. Uh, oh man, dude. No, I mean the uh, I think the big the big thing here is uh, I mean it's just a lack of information. It's it's the it's your classic. Um, yeah. The, I mean, uh, it ki- chick tracks. It ki- they're, they're exactly. Chick track. It kills me because they, they they refuse to actually look at what the church teaches. And he is like, oh, the. I mean, the original comment was that the uh, is that Rome is in the shape of a of a serpent, and it's like, like really? I think like, like that's pretty uh, on the nose, don't you think? And and when were all those buildings put there? Like they weren't there. In 33 AD, they weren't there in 100 AD. They weren't there in 150 AD. Those buildings were mostly built in the Middle Ages. So the church has been around for 2,000 years. Right. So you're saying like, so they weren't the Antichrist. And then once we put the buildings in a certain way, we then became the Antichrist. Yeah. Or did we like, or did we like put those buildings there just so we can let everybody know and give them a wink, make, hey, look, we're the Antichrist. Wink, wink. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's kind of. Kind of a weird conspiracy theory, to be honest. It's the same thing with the people are like, oh, yeah, the bishop's hat is actually a symbol of the Ichthys, the know, fish god. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, like yeah. Uh, talk about conspiracy like, theories. Right. Like, oh, so good we, we were like, wink, uh, wink. Uh, <laughs> yes. We're, we yeah. totally are not Satanists. Meanwhile, we're going to put their symbol right in our yeah. heads. Now, like, d- pff, if silly. you've listened to this show for more than a week, let's just say, you've heard us very clearly call out uh, some of the scandals inside the church and the bad actors inside the church, people that I would consider evil. I mentioned McCarrick earlier in the show today that McCarrick is not going to apparently stand trial now because he's apparently incapacitated. This is an evil man. This is a man who became a cardinal and was uh, was suppressed by Benedict and then let loose by Pope Francis, but elevated by everybody in between. This is an evil, evil man. Somehow he got to the top. He's not alone. There are others. There are other evil men who are in very powerful positions. But guess what? We have to live with the weeds, the wheat and the weeds. You do not abandon the body of Christ and create your own little sect, your own little flavor, your own little church of what's happening now. It's it's never been you and the Bible. It's never been uh, just you and Jesus. Jesus did not die on a cross to give you just himself. Yeah, mo- notice he doesn't say, go look in the Bible where it says that Rome right. is, is the Antichrist. He says, go watch this video of some random dude. Yeah. And he's like, uh, I right. forget who the person was. I can't remember. Corey Barbie. He said, go watch Corey Barbie's video yeah. and learn how he'd been deceived. Right. So is Corey Barbie the uh, the speaker of tradition? He's right. the interpreter of Holy Scripture. The world was he lost the until Corey, Corey came Barbie around. came around. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, if so. you can't explain your position other than saying, go and watch his 
20 minute video or something, I mean, you probably don't even believe it either, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Like, if you can't explain it to me in a sentence or two or even a paragraph at most, I just, I, I'm not going to waste my time to go watch your video. No, yeah. absolutely not. It would be, it would be low level, not high level. It's not, and good, also it's not all, good intellectual argument. They also all say with. the same thing. So all it's low like, level bombastic, you know, arguments that get regurgitated by Jack Chick, you yeah. know, passing out people. It's just ridiculous. And that's what kills me about it. It's like, there are much better arguments. If you're looking for great arguments, these aren't the ones. Yeah. What's your favorite Jack trick? Jack Chick tract. The one on Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. That's that's my favorite too. <laughs> you don't like the cookie? You don't like the cookie? The death cookie? No, no that's, that's offensive. That one's offensive. That's offensive. They're all offensive. What are you talking about? The Dungeons about, and Dragons one isn't. Yeah, it's whatever. Dude. It's, it's, it's like pretty funny. Yeah. Pretty cool. Oh, man. No, the, I don't like any of the ones that are sacrilegious. Yeah, those they're are bad. totally sacrilegious. Dungeons they're and Dragons all horrible. one's not sacrilegious. No, it's just saying that Dungeons Dragons is magic, therefore it's bad. demonic. Don't for, yeah. therefore don't play it. Yeah, it's it bad. No, but yeah. Man. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and Joe's right. There are like I listen to how to send to debates all the time. I enjoy that kind of thing. And honestly, the best arguments uh, against the church all come from like the Orthodox. All come from high church, right? Uh, Ang uh, uh, Protestants like Anglicans, high church Lutherans, yeah. high church Methodists, those kind of people. Uh, from evangelicals, honestly, I've never heard a really good argument. It's basically just like my interpretation of scripture is right and yeah. yours is wrong. Um, so yeah, I uh, I obviously I'm a well, it's not obvious. A lot of people, if you don't know, I'm a convert to the church. So I did a ton of study, and uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, when looking at these arguments, and I looked at various Protestants and their argumentation, and I always found that the the Jack Chick crowd. Is just weak sauce. Yeah, pretty it's much total weak sauce. There are definite better arguments that even they come to. You learn that they aren't correct. Um, uh, Hank Hennigraf is a great example of this. Hank Hennigraf spent years as the Bible Answer Man trying to do the same thing and lead Catholics out of the church. Well, guess what? <laughs> In the end, Hank had to admit that he was wrong. And he didn't have the courage to come all the way to the Catholic Church. Instead, he went Anglican. Eastern Orthodox oh, instead. Oh, Eastern Orthodox, so. You know. Most well, people go high church Anglican because they're like, yeah. the Oriental churches are kind of uh, But I, mean, I used uh, to be a hard. huge fan of Dr. David Jeremiah and R.C. Sproul and all of that stuff, man. Yeah, R.C. Sproul. I didn't realize. I just So I just did an interview. I highly recommend checking it out with um, Scholastic Answers on the history of Protestantism. So he, he, we talked about the Protestant... Reformers, the original guys, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, all those guys, and uh, traced it back because Classic Answers actually has his uh, bachelor's and master's in um, Reformation theology because yeah. he was actually studying to become an Anglican priest. Really? And then he became Catholic instead. And he's doing his, uh, I think he's working on his PhD program. And I'm not 100% sure about that, but we talked wow. about that. And I was blown away. Like he was talking about these things, and I was just like, wow, like, Modern American, we ended the conversation talking about American Protestantism and how it's different from European Protestantism. He was like, yeah, American Protestantism just went completely off the rails. Like, it's like huh. nothing like I'd never considered anywhere. really comparing those yeah, two yeah. things. Yeah, it was really interesting. What and, else was there uh, different? Yeah, it was the, the big thing is that the lack of tradition. He said, like, yeah, the uh, the old Protestants before the last, like, 100 years or so, especially in America, America's made it much worse because of the separation of church and state and all that jazz. Um, they really, because before they, they had a tradition. They were mm -hmm. like, oh, no, we follow this guy. We follow this creed. We follow this ideas. And now they're, like, completely autonomous. Uh, so he's like, this even modern evangelicalism is pretty, pretty uh, novel, even in Protestantism. Wow. And so, yeah, it was a really interesting conversation. He also talked about um, the reformers and their discussion on are the Blessed Virgin Mary. And they're like, yeah, the reformers, like some of them would be like, no, yeah, you." the original reformers were saying things like, no, you have to believe that Our Lady was ever virgin. Yeah. Like that's de fide. It's in scripture. So you have mm -hmm. to believe it. And it wasn't only until later when they were like, well... It's not 100% clear, so it's kind, of, it's kind of dumb to yeah. not believe that she's not a virgin, but it's not like you're not a heretic for saying that. Mm. And then it was only even further later where they were like, oh, yeah, you can't do that. You can't believe it. Right. And so it, it's, it was really interesting. I highly re recommend checking it out. Yeah. And uh, whew, man, I tell you what, 
arrest Trudeau. Now, whatever you do, pinky swear for me, bro. You got to promise me you will not look at church history. Okay, don't do it. Do not go back to, say, 125 AD, 150 AD, 175 AD. Do not go back to that time. Whatever you do, please do not read anything from the second century, a hundred years before Constantine was ever born. Don't read any of those documents, whatever you do, because then you will be forced to admit you are in complete and utter error. And you have no idea what you're talking about. And you're just regurgitating other errors from other people that you heard it from instead of doing any homework for yourself. Yeah, it's also interesting, too. Now I'm thinking about it. Most most Protestants today, too, would recognize that Catholics are Christians. Um, it's it's such a minority. John that, 15. That would say that he's not. John 15. The vine and the branches. Let me ask you a question. So if in John 15, Jesus is the vine. Right. We, we agree. Jesus is the vine and the branches are the people connected to him. Right. So there that vine, does that vine connect heaven and earth together? So the vine that connects heaven and earth and the branches that are connected to this vine in earth are the church militant and the vine that uh, that connects the branches in heaven, which is the church triumphant, those in heaven with the, in the beatific vision. It is still the vine that connects that those two bodies together into one body. If it be the will of God who can do anything he wants, if it be his will to allow Our Lady to hear the intercessory prayers, because she's connected to the same vine you and I are, who is that to you? What is it to you to deny God what he can choose to do of his own free will? We are connected through the vine. And when you are united in the beatific vision, you want exactly what God wants. You have lost your own personal priorities, your own personal flavors, and your own personal opinions. You have given yourself wholly out of free will, out of complete and utter love. You have been purified through the fire, as St. Paul would say. You have been purified through the fire because we know in Revelation 21 that nothing impure can enter heaven. So you are purified through fire because God is fire, and everything that you have held on to in this world is gone and all that is left is pure love, and you want what God wants. And what does God want? He wants the salvation, the perfect knowledge of salvation for all men. So what does Our Lady want? She wants exactly what God wants, which is for us to choose Jesus, her divine child, as our Savior, and to be saved, and to go to heaven. She is your greatest cheerleader. And if it is God's holy will, that because she is connected to the vine that you and I are connected to, Jesus Christ, and he allows her to hear and to understand, to receive these intercessory prayers, because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful, we are told. Who more righteous than Our Lady, who never sinned, born uh, without sin? Well, how could she be born without sin? Well, she is the Gibi Bra. She is the, the Theotokos. She is Kekaretomene, as Luke's gospel tells us. She is, she was, and she will always be full of God's grace. That is what the Greek word implies in Luke in Luke's gospel. She is the Kekaretomene. She is full of God's grace. The only person in the history of salvation to have been uh, accused of being full of God's grace is Our Lady. Joe, why do you keep quoting scripture? You got to quote Corey Barbie. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Which is also why she said, all generations will call me blessed. It is God's salvation. It is God's plan in salvation to give to you more than just himself. So if you don't call Our Lady blessed, are you violating scripture? If scripture said all generations will call I her blessed? Blow. Hmm. Hmm. Awkward. Awkward. I hate to be you. Yeah. I would hate to have to look Jesus in the eye and say, I hated your mother. Yeah, that's awkward. I told everybody to reject your mother. I told everybody that your mother was of Satan. Yikes. Could you imagine Ooh. having to say that to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Just today, I mentioned in today's gospel how he got angry with the Pharisees because they were trying to uh, say that you couldn't heal somebody on the Sabbath. And he got angry and he looked at them with anger. Imagine what he'll look at you when you have to face your judgment 
or me when I have to face my judgment for all the things that I've done, all the things that I have said, every action I have ever taken, I will have to give an account for. And by God's grace alone will I be saved. By God's grace alone will I be saved. There you go, folks. I choose Our Lady. I choose the Gibirah, the Queen Mother, who is the Queen Mother of the child that would take the throne of David, his father, and rule with an iron scepter. I choose her to intercede for me, to beg her divine child, to have mercy upon me, a sinner. Because that is the design that God created for his people. He, he is the king. A king has a court. A court has ministers. A court has a queen. And in the kingdom of David, go look it up. First Samuel, second Samuel, go look up first Kings, second Kings, go read it for yourself. First Kings, Solomon becomes king. Guess what? His mother comes to the court. He bows to her. He pulls out a chair for her in first Kings. And what does she do? That she sits at his right hand in a throne. Did you know that the Gibirah, the queen mother of the kingdom of David, all the way up until the Babylonian exile, was always the mother of the king and never his wife? Did you have any idea? Have you ever read sacred scripture? Do you even know what the Bible looks like? Crack it open sometime, dust it off, and read it for yourself. First Kings, he bows to her, his mom. He brings a throne for her. She sits at his right hand, and she does what? She intercedes on behalf of his brother. And she knew very well that this would mean his death sentence, but she did it anyway, because that's her role, that's her job, that is her liturgical function, is to intercede on behalf of the people in the court of her son, the king. That is what Bathsheba did in 1 Kings. That is the role of the Gibirah. The Gibirah was an office that was fulfilled all the way up to the Babylonian exile when the king and his mom, the Gibirah, the queen, was hauled off in slavery. Well, that role is now filled by the Blessed Virgin Mary, the, the mother of the Word incarnate, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not rocket science. The problem is you have closed your mind, your heart, and your ears to understanding anything because you reject what Christ has established. Yeah, long story short, don't be deceived by the evil one because he is trying to lead you away from our Lord. He's trying to lead you away from his mother. And he's trying to lead you away from his scripture by uh, engrossing you in these weird conspiracy theories. So I would advocate staying away from all that uh, lest you lose your soul and end up damned, burning in hell for all eternity. So on a <laughs> high lighter note, Sky, uh, Skylin, good morning to you, said, I think my dad would love to hear you sing happy birthday to him. All right. What? It's Master Baker's birthday? It's Matt Herney. It's Master Baker's birthday. So we what? got to sing happy birthday. Mind blown. Like Marilyn Monroe? No. Oh, <laughs> awkward. Awkward. I'm going to let you, oh, you solve that one. Happy birthday. <laughs> Matt, what are we talking about? All right. Just kidding. Just kidding. Well, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Master, Master Baker. Baker. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> By the way, may the dear Lord bless you. May yeah. the dear Lord bless you. May yeah. the dear Lord bless Master mm -hmm. Baker. May the dear Lord bless mm -hmm. you. Should I think Adrian should wrap it like one of his favorite boxers? Wicka did. wicka. <laughs> um. Like, like Mayweather? Like, no, it was number 10. It was, it was uh, uh, Captain Hook. It was Captain Hook. What's his name? Roy Jones Jr. Roy Jones Jr. You should have to rap it like him. I don't even know how he raps. Uh, look it up. Maybe we get another copyright strike. You know what's cool? <laughs> you know, <laughs> a random factoid. Uh-huh. Muhammad Ali said that he's not sure that he could beat Rocky Marciano. Really? Yeah. He publicly went out and said that he doesn't know. He said he thinks he might have lost to Rocky Marciano. Would you argue, uh, hold up, pause that. I need to say this, but first, uh, Master Baker said, my father-in-law passed away on Monday. Oh. It was the anniversary of his enlistment into the Army. This Saturday before, I had the honor of baptizing him. Oh, wow. wow. That's Praise amazing. Be to God. Praise be to God. Baker. Happy birthday again to you. Praise be to God. Uh, would you say, going back to boxing, 
Very important. Muhammad Ali was the greatest showman in the sport? Oh, easily. Easily greatest showman. People like he would just dance around the ring literally. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he would avoid punches with just his face. Yeah, just because he could. Just because uh, he could. Yeah, no, he he's really good. Sonny Liston, he was also really good, but mm-hmm. I think Muhammad Ali was better than him. Mm-hmm. Um, is Muhammad Ali really the greatest of all time? That could be debated. He's definitely top five for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of it is star power, though. I think you're right. A lot of it the, is that he was like so showy, and he made yeah. winning look effortless, even though he he went 15 rounds. He went the distance his, a number of times. He was pretty old in his last fight. He also had Parkinson's. Yeah. So. Um, what What was your opinion of Will Smith's portrayal of Muhammad Ali? I didn't watch it. What? <laughs> I didn't watch it. You did not watch it? No. Nope. Why? I don't know. I thought it was. I thought he did. Gr- I couldn't believe Will Smith could I also, act. I also didn't. Watch. That was the first time I realized Will Smith could act. Well, did he get jiggy with it? Dramas. He wasn't getting jiggy with it. But he was. Uh, he put he on weight. Fin- have you he seen his movie? Got all in fences. Will Smith and Fences? Oh, no, that was Denzel Washington. I know Denzel can act. Good <laughs> grief. <laughs> of course. Was Denzel, Denzel can a, act. He was in a, he, Will Smith has been in some dramas, right? The, before Muhammad Ali, most of Will's work was not quite at that level. Like, this hmm. was the first, I, if I'm not mistaken, this was the I don't first know, maybe I'll Will watch Smith it. film that was like, whoa, this guy, this guy's serious. I don't know, man. <laughs> I, maybe I'll watch it. I didn't watch it. I didn't watch the Mike Tyson movie either. It came out already. I and haven't seen the Mike Tyson I was gonna, film. I thought about watching it, but I was like, eh. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I already know about his life. I've listened to Mike Tyson talk about his life millions of times. Best but boxing movie ever. Best pff, Rocky Balboa. <laughs> Not Rocky Balboa. Rocky II. Rocky II. Wait, what's Rocky, that? No, oh, recent three. One. Rocky three. Cinderella Man is one of my that's, favorites. That's the one I was It's not about. recent, though. It's fairly old now, but Cinderella Man was a great film. How about really um, enjoyed it. Raging Bull? What about you? Yeah. Wasn't there a movie about a daughter? What about the Mark Wahlberg daughter? boxing film? That one. Which one? The so Mark Wahlberg has played a couple of boxers. Oh, Father oh, Stu was Father's, his most no, recent no, no, one. No, the other one. But he did another one. Uh, the, the crackhead one. The crackhead. Where his brother was the crackhead. Yeah, I know what you're talking from about. From Lowell, Massachusetts. Hmm. Lowell. I forget. What was that one called? Someone remind us. Yeah. What was that movie? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but Rocky Marciano, he's way underrated. And most people don't even know who he is. If you get a chance today, go look up Rocky Marciano mm-hmm. and watch some highlights. So much fun to watch. Uh, but, okay, back to this. Mm-hmm. How are it was not a single Mexican boxer on the top oh, ten list? I forgot to do that part. <laughs> not a single <laughs> Mexican boxer. Mm, sorry. What's up um, with that? Yeah. I did. Okay. Who, who, George I, Foreman? What, what about that? George Foreman? Barely noticed. All right, so coming in at number 11, let's go the other way real quick. <laughs> Willie Pep. Willie Pep. Yeah. I don't even know who that is. Is that where they say they mm-hmm. put a pep in your step? <laughs> I don't know. It could be. Coming in at number 12, Roberto Duran. Roberto Duran? Isn't that a football player? Uh, no. Uh, coming in at number 13, Joe George Fraser. Foreman. Oh, George Foreman. George that makes Foreman. sense. That number makes sense. 14, Marvelous Marvin Hagler. That also makes sense. Okay. Number 15, Jack Johnson. Mm, don't know who that is. The Are you artist? kidding? I don't know who Joe Johnson is. Jack Johnson was a trailblazer. Okay, what about Julio Cesar Chavez? Coming in at number 16, Joe, Joe Frazier. Okay, Joe, Joe Frazier should probably be higher up in that Coming list. Coming in at number 18, James what? Jeffries. You skipped one. Well, I'm sorry, what? You skipped one. Uh, 19, Where are you going? Jack Dempsey. Hey, 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 go 20, back. Hey, go back. 21, Lennox Lewis. <laughs> Lennox Lewis. 21, Lennox Lewis. What the 22, <laughs> Evander Holyfield. What, what Dude, level? What is this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Insanity Holyfield. are we this talking about? This is garbage. <laughs> 23 <laughs> was Benny Leonard. 24, Sonny Lit. Sonny Lit. 24. 25. Sam Langford. Um, I think you uh, skipped uh-huh, number sorry. 17. No, so no mention whatsoever. You, you skipped 17. I never. Could, could you go back to I'm sorry, 17? I'm, we're out of time. <laughs> time number, is up. It's okay. We, we can extend. We can extend. Well, I, I'm it's sorry. fine. Well, it's fine. Um, could, you, could you read number 17? You, yo, you want me to read? Yeah, I want to read 17. 17. 17. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, 17 uh-huh. here. Let's that, see. Uh-huh. Does that come after 16? Two. And uh-huh. before 18? I know it's hard for Marines okay. to count, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Coming in at number 17, Julio Cesar Chavez. Now we got a copyright strike. Let's get ready to <laughs> rumble. Julio 
Cesar Chavez <laughs> should be like top 10. Are you kidding me? That guy was like undefeated. He was like, he fought like 200 fights. Like um, Mayweather's like, I'm the greatest of all time. I fought 50 and 0. Julio Cesar Chavez went, was like 120 before he lost a fight. He fought 120 uh, professional fights before he lost. Like that, no, no. He's got a, he's got no. a 120 Laura, KD. Real quick, Laura says, my grandfather was sparring partner with to Dempsey. What? Wow. Ooh, that's amazing. Million Dollar Baby. Our, nah, I didn't like the outcome of that film. Billion hey, God Dollar God bless baby? you. God love you. We'll see you guys back here tomorrow. Pray for Protestants. Pray for their conversion. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. Don't do it. It won't get done. If God don't do it, it won't get done. What up with that? What up with that? What up with that? Come on, man. What are we talking about? Come on, man. Go, Brandon. I agree. <laughs> hey.